Hi everyone, welcome back to another session in Financial Forensics. My name is Prasanna and today we will learn about Explainable AI. In today's session, we will first try to understand what Explainable AI is, which is shortly called XAI and how XAI is used in the finance industry, specifically in fraud detection and forensics. We will learn the fundamental concepts of SHAP framework a widely used XAI framework and using this SHAP framework we will try to explain and understand a fraud detection model which was built in the earlier session. What is explainable AI? Explainable AI is a set of tools and techniques that is used to understand how a model is performing a prediction. So it also provides insights on features specifically to understand the interdependency between features and uh, also how a particular feature is influencing the final outcome of the model. Now we have a basic question. We already have uh, metrics like accuracy, F1 score to explain the performance of a model. So why do we need an additional XAI framework? So there are multiple reasons. Let us go through them one by one. First, first explain and translate a black box model. So in the process of model development, when we build a simple model like a logistic regression, it is always easier for us to translate back how a specific prediction has been made by the model and relate it to the input training data. However, if we move on to a complex model like uh, neural networks or XGBoost ensemble techniques, it is hard for us to understand how the underlying base data is impacting the final output made by the model. XAI framework will provide an end-to-end -end relationship and representation of how in every individual feature is affecting the final model, final model output. A better decision is not always tied to accuracy or RMSE. Uh, the higher accuracy or lower RMSE are model performance metrics that explain how accurate a model is. However, uh, for a business decision, uh, it not only depends upon the model's metrics but also depends upon the underlying data which has been used. Hence, there should be a clear relationship between the data and the model's uh, final prediction in order to make any business decision. Third. Model running in closed environments. Uh, Let us consider a typical ML ops life cycle. A data scientist develops a model, transfers the model to a machine learning engineer. Uh, the machine learning engineer deploys it in a production environment and there is an end user, uh, let us say a market analyst, using the output of that predicted model for one of the business decision. Now for a market analyst to use the model effectively, he must understand the complete working and performance of the model. Right now, the model development where the essential features that go into the model is uh, controlled only by a data scientist and the market analyst has to rely on the final output of the model unless until there is a clear understanding of how the model has made the prediction, it is always going to be difficult for a market analyst to interpret his results. Finally, feature selection. Feature selection is the critical activity during model development both in model selection and model validation. In order to understand uh, the model's performance as well as to compare between different models, uh, we need to understand the essential features that go into a specific model and XAI framework has a specific way of explaining how each individual feature is impacting the final outcome and this provides more insight for the developer or the data scientist to use or validate these features that go into the model. So we have three different uh, explainability or interpretations in XAI. Uh, one at the global level, then at the cohort level and finally at the local level. All these three explainabilities are used at uh, different uh, stages of the model development cycle. Now let us consider a use case uh, where we, uh, we are developing a model that can predict the maximum credit limit to be given to a new user who is opting for a credit card. 
In order to build this model, we take the historical records, create a training data set and provide this training data set for different models and try to compare the output of different models. Under global explainability, we try to understand the model's performance and functioning on the overall training data set. So consider uh, if consider by uh, using global explainability, we, we are able to under okay. using global explainability, we are able to gain the confidence on different features that go into the model. Uh, for instance, let's say in our uh, use case, we consider age is one of the prime uh, feature that influences the final uh, prediction, and hence age can be considered as one of the features that go into the model. Similarly, using global explainability, we can able to, we are able to compare two different models and try to understand which model performs better. Global explainability is primarily used during the model training phase in order to understand the features and to compare between different models. Now let's move on to the cohort explainability. In cohort explainability, we are trying to understand the model's performance on a subset of data. Why do we want to understand the model's performance on a subset of data? Let's take the same use case. Right now, we have identified age as a primary feature that goes into the model and it has a specific relationship with the output. However, it may not be uniform for all the records. Uh, in a real world scenario, there can be a teenager who is affordable to have a maximum credit limit, a higher value, whereas we have a senior citizen who cannot afford a higher value. And uh, when comparing this real world scenario, uh, we cannot have a single expression or a single uh, function that relates age with the final output. Hence, the age has to be subdivided into cohorts or groups and we have to understand the model's performance under each different group. So this is where the cohort explainability comes into play. And uh, using cohort explainability, uh, we will be able to overcome underperformance of the model and also avoid overfitting. Hence, this explainability is widely used in model validation and model selection. Finally, local explainability. So, in local explainability, we are trying to understand how a model is has made a prediction on a given specific record. So, why do we need the model's explanation at granular level of a record? This is because models that are put into production provide an output and the business decisions are made on that specific output. And if there is a discrepancy, we need to do a root cause analysis and for the root cause analysis, we need to know how individual features had contributed to that prediction. Now let's consider how XAI is used in the financial industry, especially in fraud detection. We need to focus on two T's here. The first T is trustworthy, which comes from a customer's perspective. So let's say we have built a fraud detection model and uh, the fraud detection model is running in a transaction monitoring application and whenever it uh, suspects a specific transaction to be fraud, it rejects or declines that particular transaction. Now we have a customer who makes a unusual transaction, uh, something like a medical emergency and which is outside his regular behavior. Sometimes uh, the model may decline the transaction considering to be fraud. Now, how can we make a system that is trustworthy and improve customer satisfaction? Uh, point number one, we must have the model which is capable of handling such outlier scenarios, capable of handling this outlier scenarios, or we should have rules and regulations that are put in place between teams so that such a scenario is handled in a different uh, perspective. So let's say if a transaction gets declined, a specific uh, fraud investigation team connects with the customer and uh, ensures that uh, it's a genuine transaction and the transaction can be open. In this way, we can have a trustworthy uh, uh, model uh, or a trustworthy process for uh, financial fraud detection. And in order to make this model trustworthy, uh, the model should be interoperatable, uh, which means that XAI framework provides model explainability at each level from the global to the uh, local level. Hence, it's easier for a team member irrespective of whether he is a data scientist or an end of investigator to understand why that prediction was made. 
Next, we move on to the second T, which is transparent. Uh, this comes from a financial institution's perspective. A financial institution has both internal and external factors uh, that uh, ensure that the model is transparent. From an external factor, the financial institution must comply to the regulatory acts. In order to comply with regulatory acts, any model that is put into production must not be a black box. It should be transparent and explainable to the committee at any point of time. XAI provides a clear explanation of any black box model that is being put into production. Moving to the internal factor, uh, this is uh, very similar to the uh, example of improving uh, customer satisfaction where a specific fraud investigation involves different teams and uh, a model which is put into production should be explainable and understandable by different teams irrespective of their skill set. Now let's move on to uh, the SHAP framework uh, which is one of the most widely used uh, XAA framework. SHAP comes from the game theory concept of Shapley values. Now consider we have a game where there are n different players with different skill sets, different skill sets playing together to win a prize. Now once they win a prize, the prize has to be distributed among the players with an equal and fair share. Now we are using the same concept of the fair share division which is the Shapley values in order to interpret or explain a model. Here, the game is nothing but the outcome of a model and the players are the essential features that go into predicting the outcome of the model. Now let's try to understand the fundamental concepts of Sharpe value. So for this let's consider a use case uh, considering that we are in a products team and we have introduced three products debit card, credit card and UPA over the last year. And uh, we have observed that uh, with we have observed that the profit margin is 50k without in, before introducing all these products and after introducing these products we find the overall profit margin increase to 83k now the objective is trying to understand how each individual product has influenced to the positive impact and uh, budget the current year's uh, expense on the product so on the right, what we see is a feature power set. The feature power set is a tree-shaped structure at multiple levels depending upon the number of features that are introduced. In our case, feature is nothing but the product we have introduced. Since we have three products introduced, we have three levels of uh, the power set. Now at level F0, where there is no feature, which means no product, our profit margin is 50k, and uh, which is indicated in node 1. Now as we traverse to node 2, we see that we have introduced the product called uh, debit card and observed that the profit margin reduced to 40k. And at this level which is fe feature 1, we also try to understand how other products have impacted to the profit margin. Moving to the next level, we try to understand how two products co run in coalition or two products perform together and what is the profit margin by using those two products. Here we can see in node 5 that using debit card and credit card we see the profit margin is 39k. And finally we level, go to the level 3 where we see the profit margin by using all the three products. Now uh, this feature power set gives a overall picture of how each individual product has performed. But how do we quantify uh, the impact of each individual product on the final profit margin? In order to do that we have to calculate the Shapley values and Shapley values are calculated in two steps. First we calculate the marginal contribution then we calculate the weighted marginal contribution. Let's try to calculate the marginal contribution. Marginal contribution is calculated between two nodes. Let's consider node 1 and node 2. So in node 1 uh, without uh, introducing any product we see that the profit margin is 50 and after introducing we see that the product uh, the pro the profit margin is 40. Hence the marginal contribution of introducing debit card is minus 10k. Now this marginal contribution is calculated at only one level or one specific edge. Now the introduction of debit card or the contribution of debit card to the final outcome depends upon all the nodes where we have used debit card. So this denotes that So 
So here we have used debit card in node 2, node 5, node 6 and node 8. So we need to calculate the marginal contribution at each of these different nodes. In addition to that, in order to calculate the SHAP value, we must add a weighted factor to all these marginal contribution which depend upon the level uh, in which the nodes are placed. Now let's calculate the weighted marginal contribution. Uh, on the right what we see is the feature power set which is color coded for each different for each individual level. Level 0 is blue and level 3 is green. In order to calculate the weighted marginal contribution we must first calculate the weight which is uh, related to the number of combinations that can happen at a particular level. Let us consider F0 where there is one node and there is no edges, it is 0. And as we move from uh, F0 to F1, we see that there are three nodes and there are three possible edges or possible combinations. Hence the contribution of one particular product is weighted by the number of edges in that particular level. So the W1 which indicates the weights between node 1 to node 2 is 1 by 3. Now let us move to the level 2 where we have 6 possible edges. We have 6 possible combinations. For this particular node we can have a combination of debit card and credit card or credit card and debit card in the different order. Hence level 2 has 3 nodes however 6 possible combinations or 6 edges. Hence W2 and W3 we have the weights as 1 by 6. Now as we move on to the level 3 we see that there are 3 nodes and 3 possible combinations. Hence W4 is 1 by 3. Now in order to calculate the Shapley value for a particular product, we need to introduce the weights and their particular ma marginal contribution. Now uh, the different weights W1, W2, W3 and W4 along with the marginal contribution at each level, we are able to populate that the Shapley value for debit cards is negative 11.3. Using the same expression uh, with their respective weights and marginal contribution, we can calculate the Shapley values of different products which are indicated here. So we see that debit card and credit card had a negative impact on uh, the base value and UPA had a positive uh, impact on the base value. In order to understand this better, let us consider a linear line where uh, we have 50k as the base value where we have not introduced any product. Now uh, based on introducing debit card, we understood that uh, the marginal contribution is minus 11.3. So this pushes the graph to minus 61.3 which is DC and uh, further uh, down uh, the credit card pushes this further down to minus 2.33 which is minus 63.66. And we have a positive impact of UPI which is 46.66 directly translating to 33k. Now this explains the difference between 50k to 33k and it clearly explains how these individual features have impacted the final outcome 33k.